Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sanders Facts. Hello, everybody. Welcome into the latest edition of the Xander's Facts podcast. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander. It is Wednesday, October 11th. We have got episode 120 of the podcast coming up for you this week. It is a big one. Of course, we are talking politics once again, just like last week. This week, though, we are talking about something that a lot, well, a certain news channel has dedicated major coverage to. And, you know, should they be? That's a question. But we are talking about Hunter Biden. Who? This week, y'all, because I feel like I'm going to explain this in a minute, but I feel like there's a lot of angst on both sides. On one side, you've got people who want to constantly berate, talk about it, sometimes, a lot of times, with falsehoods, and talk about how it affects other people. And then on the other side, you kind of have people who want to sweep it under the rug. But we're not doing that this week, and we're not talking about falsehoods this week. Because we don't have any of those on the Zaders Facts podcast. We only have facts. This week, we are talking about the truth about Hunter Biden. What you need to know. Because it has come into our political realm of importance, apparently. So we have to talk about it. But that's what we're doing this week. Just to remind you all, before we get to that, though, that if you like the Xander's Facts podcast, if you think you're going to like all the facts on this week's edition, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 120, rate and review the podcast, check us out on all the socials, Twitter, threads, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at Xander's Facts, that's Xander with a Z, and most importantly, remember to tell all your friends, spread the facts, tell everybody you know about the Xander's Facts podcast, and also about Xander's Weekend Facts, which if you didn't know, is our weekly newsletter that comes out every Sunday morning. It's a recap of the week's top headlines written by me. Sign up. It is free to get it in your email inbox in this episode's description. And also check out the Xander's Facts link tree because it has all the Xander's Facts links that you need. Link tr.ee slash Xander's Facts. It is linked in this episode's description. And also check out any of our past episodes too. Any of the past 119 episodes we've done, including last week where we talked about Project 2025. If you don't know what that is, you might want to listen to the podcast from last week. Uh, previous weeks, we've talked about the Hollywood strikes, NFL season preview, bunch of Xander's Facts flashbacks. Go listen to all those past episodes if you've missed out. But let's get to this week's main topic, which, as I said, is Hunter Biden. I'm going to give you all basically everything you really need to know, because I think there's some people who might have read the title of this podcast and gotten turned off immediately because of whatever side you're on. But what I'm going to do, because... The president's son, Hunter, if you didn't know, he is Joe Biden's son, has drawn the ire of many across the aisle. And so what I'm trying to do this week is bring you clarity and facts to the situation. Because I think when you hear what the list of priorities have been for the Republican Party recently, the name Hunter Biden has likely come up. Or if you've been watching some Fox News, because his name has been put up there a lot. Hunter Biden, as I said, is obviously one of President Joe Biden's sons and is under tight scrutiny for the actions he's taken in his past. But considering those in the Fox News realm kind of like to sometimes muddy the waters between, you know, truth and lies, I thought I'd get down to what exactly has been going on. And I'll acknowledge, you know, there are also some supporters of the Bidens on the other side of the aisle who would probably rather sweep this stuff under the rug. But I thought this quote from the New York Times back in August explained it pretty well. Quote, if you're a Republican, there's a good chance that you believe Democrats and the mainstream media are deliberately minimizing a scandal that calls into question President Biden's honesty and threatens his presidency. And if you're a Democrat, you likely believe that this so-called scandal is a transparent attempt to distract from Donald Trump's far worse behavior. You may see the Hunter Biden obsession as the latest in a line of conservative conspiracy theories, joining Barack Obama's birthplace, John Kerry's Vietnam War record, and the suicide of Vince Foster, unquote. I had to look that last one up. Of course, normally, we wouldn't care about all this if it was just a regular American citizen, but yes, it is the son of the President of the United States, so it does get out there. So I'm going to do a little quick podcast this week as we roll through Hunter Biden's past, why he's currently being investigated by the Department of Justice and by Republicans in the House of Representatives, and whether it's all worth impeaching the president over, because that's a uh, topic that we also have to discuss when we're talking about Hunter Biden. And then we'll probably never talk about Hunter Biden on the podcast again, because, you know, he's not the one who's running for office. 
So let's get into it this week. I've got all the facts for y'all. Starting out by basically just going through a timeline of Hunter Biden's life, his past actions. Starting all the way back in 1970. Let's do it. Because that's when Hunter was born. But the Biden family, not just Hunter, have really had a tumultuous life. And when you talk about the actions, so we're going to talk about it in a second, but, you know, the things that Hunter Biden's done, some of them, you can kind of go and look back in his past and say, oh, well, that, you know, kind of makes sense. But when Hunter was just two years old, 1972, Joe Biden's first wife, Nelia Hunter Biden, if you didn't know, Jill Biden, the current first lady, is his second wife. His first wife was killed in a car accident near the Biden's home in Wilmington, Delaware, in 1972. Biden's sister, Naomi, who was born in 1971, was also killed in the crash. And both Hunter and his older brother, Bo, who was born in 1969, were also in the car, but they survived the crash. But they spent months in the hospital. So this happened just over one month after Joe Biden, their dad, had first been elected to the Senate. In 1972, he's been in politics a long time, but he took the oath of office, actually, next to his two sons, who were in the hospital. And then, fast forward, Hunter later graduated from Georgetown in 1992, Yale Law School in 1996, and he got married to Kathleen Buell in 1993. So then, after graduating from Yale, Hunter worked at MBNA America, which is a bank in Delaware that was later bought by Bank of America. That bank at the time was a top contributor to Joe Biden's political campaigns. So obviously you kind of have, you know, it gets a little interesting there, but that's not really what's being focused on. But starting in 2001, Hunter was a partner at a law and lobbying firm, Oldeker, Biden, and Belair. But he dropped all of his lobbying clients in 2008, while his father was obviously Barack Obama's vice presidential nominee. Now, Joe Biden actually ran for president himself in 2008, but he kind of dropped out early in the process because he wasn't really a top candidate. But then he got selected by Obama to be his vice presidential nominee. And so back in 2019, The New Yorker reported that Hunter and Joe didn't talk about Hunter's lobbying clients, even as Politico magazine noted that Hunter did lay in, quote, clients with interests that overlapped with his father's committee assignments and legislative priorities, unquote. So those lobbying activities, they were in addition to, in 2006, Hunter and his uncle James, President Biden's brother, bought hedge fund group Paradigm Global Advisors. And through the time in 2010, where they liquidated the fund and returned the money to investors, the fund was actually connected to several alleged fraudsters, including a Texas financier who was convicted of running one of the largest Ponzi schemes in U.S. history, but ultimately there were no charges brought against the Bidens or wrongdoing found. And then Hunter was also, I didn't know this, he was appointed to a five-year term on the Amtrak board of directors by then-president George W. Bush in 2006, and he resigned in 2009 after his father became vice president. And then after that happened, getting into the 2010s, in 2013, Hunter took a founding board seat at BHR, which is a Shanghai-based investment firm, China, which, according to the New York Times, quote, helped to finance an Australian coal mining company controlled by a Chinese state-owned firm, and assisted a subsidiary of a Chinese defense conglomerate in buying a Michigan auto parts maker, unquote. Also in 2013, Hunter was discharged from the U.S. Navy Reserves after he tested positive for cocaine use on his first day at Naval Station Norfolk. And we'll talk about the cocaine use a little bit more later. And then in 2014... Hunter joined the board of a Ukrainian energy company called Burisma Holdings. You've probably heard of Burisma if you've read anything or heard anything about Hunter Biden. What are you talking about? It's been found that Hunter was paid over $800,000 in 2013 and over $1.2 million in 2014. And during this time, this is where, you know, you're kind of like, hmm, Vice President Joe Biden was overseeing U.S.-Ukraine relations for the Obama administration, and the vice president was advocating for the removal 
of Ukraine's top prosecutor, Viktor Shokin, at the time because of his alleged corruption, and Shokin was eventually removed by the parliament in Ukraine in 2016. And so obviously, because you have Hunter Biden on that board, and then you have Joe Biden overseeing U.S.-Ukraine relations, some members of a certain political party have jumped to some conclusions, which we're going to get to also in just a little bit. Then, 2015, tragedy struck the Biden family again, because Bo Biden who was the oldest son of Joe and the former attorney general of Delaware. He died of brain cancer. He was just 46 years old. And y'all, I don't know how much you all know about this, but if Bo Biden hadn't died, Joe Biden probably would have run for president in 2016. It would have been him versus Hillary for the Democratic nomination. Like I'm pretty sure he said before, that's the reason he didn't run is because his son had just died. And Bo and his brother Hunter had been described as really tight. And so Hunter, you know, he first experienced an addiction to alcohol back in the early 2000s, and he was in and out of rehabilitation the last two decades. But Hunter relapsed after his brother died, and he eventually became addicted to crack cocaine as well, with him writing in his 2021 memoir, which is titled Beautiful Things, that at its height, he was, quote, smoking crack every 15 minutes, unquote, which is an addiction. This is true. Hunter then got divorced from his wife, Kathleen, in 2017, which he says was caused because of Hunter, quote, spending extravagantly on his own interests while leaving the family with no funds to pay legitimate bills, unquote. That apparently included drugs, alcohol, prostitutes, strip clubs, and gifts for women that he had sexual relations with. And Hunter it's been confirmed that he actually entered a relationship with Bo's widow, Hallie Biden, that happened before Hunter and his wife got divorced, which he confirmed actually to the New Yorker. Then October 2018, Hunter bought a 38 caliber handgun at StarQuest Shooters and Survival Supply in Delaware and marked on a government form that he was not using drugs at the time. That's something we have to come back to later. Then in 2019, Hunter left a damaged laptop oh, computer at a computer repair shop in Delaware. Hunter Biden laptop, y'all. You see where they get it? Morning, morning. The owner of the shop said he found alarming and embarrassing content on the computer, which he informed the FBI about, and the laptop's hard drive was actually later seized by the FBI. And later that year, Hunter married. Melissa Cohen, a South African filmmaker in Los Angeles, just six days after they first met. Also that year, it was a wild year for Hunter, because DNA testing confirmed that he was the father of Navy Roberts, who had been born to London Roberts in August of 2018. And Hunter wrote in his memoir that he had no recollection of an encounter with Roberts, although he did begin paying child support in 2020. I believe that they kind of contested that then for a couple years, and then this year, earlier this year, those payments began going through. And so then in October of 2019, Hunter stepped down from the board of BRH, that Chinese investment firm, as his father's presidential campaign was ramping up. Joe Biden actually said he claimed in the final days of the 2020 election that his son had never made any money from China, which was not true. Joe Biden lied, y'all. He then claimed, though, that then-President Donald Trump was the only guy who made money from China. He isn't the only guy, but he has made money from China. The Trumps actually received $5 million from CEFC, which is a Chinese oil and gas company with links to the Chinese Communist Party, as part of a bribery scheme that took place in Trump World Tower. CEFC actually bought a $5 million apartment on the 78th floor of that building, the company also paid $4.8 million to entities controlled by Hunter and his uncle James in 2017 and 2018. And Hunter also partnered with the Chinese oil tycoon in 2017 on a natural gas project in Louisiana. That fell apart because the tycoon was detained on corruption charges in China and then disappeared. Whoops. So... There you go. And then in December of 2020, this all comes full circle. Hunter disclosed that he was under investigation by the Department of Justice, an investigation that began in 2018. So that's kind of like the timeline. 
of what's been going on in Hunter's life. Hunter is now sober. He had an intervention in 2019 with his family. He hasn't been entangled in any foreign business deals recently. And he's frequently been seen at the White House since Joe Biden got inaugurated. So this brings me to the question of why is Hunter Biden being investigated? You might be able to tell based on, you know, the past that I read. And listen, y'all, Hunter Biden has been through a lot of stuff. Like, you know, the foreign business dealings are, you know, there's really no excuse for that. But the alcohol addiction and the drug addictions, which he has said are directly related to the family traumas he's had in his life. At two years old, his mom and his sister died in the same car that he was in. His brother, who he was really close to, died in 2015. Like, yeah, I mean, that stuff doesn't just happen on accident. Like, I'm not saying it's good or anything. I'm just saying, you know, that's trauma right there. And that's how trauma is dealt with poorly. So back to my question why is Hunter Biden being investigated? Well, we've got the two separate investigations. We've got the Department of Justice investigation, and then we've got what the House Republicans are doing, which we'll talk about in a second. But first, with the Department of Justice investigation, the U.S. attorney in Delaware was examining potential criminal tax violations and money laundering laws committed by Hunter Biden. If we fast forward to June of this year, Biden agreed to a plea deal with the Justice Department that would see him plead guilty to two misdemeanor tax charges, which are failing to pay his 2017 and 2018 taxes on time, and enter a pretrial diversion agreement related to a separate gun charge. Because prosecutors believe that Biden, on that government form in 2018, when he said he wasn't using drugs when he bought that handgun, prosecutors believe that Biden lied, that he was on drugs. And the deal would require Biden to remain drug free for 24 months and agree to never own a firearm again. And DOJ also confirmed that Biden owed over $100,000 in each of the two years in taxes that he didn't file. And so, just for context, the U.S. attorney in Delaware is David C. Weiss, who was initially appointed in 2018 by, yes, then President Donald Trump and was retained by President Biden. He is a member of the Republican Party. Biden obviously retained him because he was investigating his son and didn't want to meddle into it, despite what some people would have you think. However, Republicans did publicly push back against the plea deal, accusing President Biden of orchestrating a lenient penalty. So, okay, President Biden did keep on this Trump-appointed attorney in Delaware who's a investigating his son, but he did orchestrate a lenient penalty for him. That's, that was the method of thinking there. Huh. Then, then, I get to say, not the current House Speaker, but then House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said the agreement, quote, continues to show the two-tier system in America, unquote. He continued, quote, if you are the president's leading political opponent, DOJ tries to literally put you in jail and give you prison time. If you are the president's son, you get a sweetheart deal, unquote. Of course, you all can go back to the several podcasts that we've done over the last several months, breaking down the four indictments of Trump, and you can understand why he is he has been charged, not just by DOJ, but by state-level prosecutors, too. Because, as the New York Times noted at the time, quote, Mr. Trump is accused of willfully retaining national defense secrets in violation of the Espionage Act, making false statements, and engaging in a conspiracy to obstruct justice. Far more serious crimes than the ones for which the younger Mr. Biden was scrutinized, unquote. However, that plea deal fell apart because a federal judge did not approve of that deal. This was District Court Judge in Delaware, Mariela Narica. She questioned whether the agreement gave Hunter Biden isolation against future prosecution on the matters that were investigated by federal prosecutors, and Judge Narica also questioned the diversion program on the gun charge. So then, negotiations over the plea deal resumed, and then they kind of quickly fell apart. Oops! But the New York Times actually published a report in August into how the deal fell apart, revealing that Weiss, who is the lead prosecutor in the case, Robert Weiss, actually determined in late 2022, late last year, 
that he didn't even have enough evidence to prosecute Hunter for major felonies and preferred to not even bring any misdemeanor charges because, as he allegedly told an associate, an average American would not be prosecuted for similar offenses, although the Times notes that a senior law enforcement official forcefully denied that account. But, as House Republicans were also investigating Hunter Biden, which they had done ever since they had started, their majority in January of 2023, they found that a veteran IRS investigator was willing to testify. That investigator, Gary Shapley, claimed that he felt stymied when trying to pursue an investigation into Hunter Biden by having a search warrant on Joe Biden's guest house denied and a search warrant on Hunter Biden's storage unit derailed. And Shapley also took his allegations to the Department of Justice's watchdog in February of this year he also claimed that Weiss had told him that federal prosecutors in D.C. and California had refused to bring tax charges against Hunter and that Weiss had considered asking Attorney General Merrick Garland to appoint him as a special counsel in the case late last year, the latter of which Weiss and Garland have both publicly denied. And on May 15th of this year, it was reported that the investigative team that was working on the Hunter Biden case had been removed and lawyers for a second tax investigator sent a letter to the IRS commissioner, which had claimed that the team of investigators have been removed after expressing concerns about political interference from the Justice Department. Now, as two IRS agents, including Shapley, testified before Congress, Weiss apparently changed his tune because now he was demanding that Biden do plead guilty to the two misdemeanor counts of failing to pay his taxes, which actually. Biden's attorney thought crossed the line, and then Biden actually himself ultimately agreed to after speaking with his attorney. But ultimately, the deal fell apart, partially because the Justice Department actually described the case into Biden in court as ongoing because of possible additional charges under the Foreign Agents Restriction Act. That requires that anyone who acts on behalf of a foreign government like in this case, China or Ukraine, register with DOJ and file regular reports on their activities for those governments. And Biden changed his plea on the misdemeanor charges from guilty to not guilty after the plea deal fell apart. These are facts. So after the plea deal fell apart, that led Weiss to being named as a special counsel in the case by the attorney general after he requested the appointment. And then on September 6th, DOJ did claim the Department of Justice that Weiss would ask a grand jury to return an indictment on Biden on a gun charge by the end of the month, and Biden was then indicted in Delaware on three federal gun charges, two for making false statements on a firearm application form, and one for prohibited possession of a firearm on September 13th, and pled not guilty to the charges on October 3rd, so just over a week ago. And then next year, Hunter is expected to be put on trial. So that's the investigation from the Department of Justice. Meanwhile, as I said, House Republicans were conducting their own investigation into Hunter Biden's business dealings. And as they were conducting that investigation, a former business partner of Hunter's, Devon Archer, told the House Oversight Committee during closed-door testimony back in July that Joe Biden had, the current president, Joe Biden, had met and spoken to some of Hunter's international business associates, including while he was vice president. However, Democrats on the committee noted that Archer claimed the now president was not a party to any business deals and that while Hunter had tried to sell the illusion that he was providing access to his father, he actually was not. But that did lead Republicans to claim that Joe Biden had lied when he claimed that he had no involvement in his son's business deals, with some saying it was grounds for impeachment. First off, though, if he wasn't involved in the business deals, you're kind of stretching it when saying he had involvement, and is that even grounds for impeachment? But Democrats, however, claimed that Archer had said the conversations with Joe Biden were short and casual, Topics discussed basically such as the weather, and the interactions were basically little more than just stopping by a dinner or a hotel for a handshake or exchanging pleasantries over the phone. Now, throughout the process, 
Republicans have accused both President Biden and Hunter of accepting millions of dollars in bribes, which Archer testified that he had no knowledge of. Republicans still do not have evidence for that claim and have admonished the director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, who, just a reminder, was appointed by Donald Trump. They've admonished him for not allowing a document containing an unverified allegation of bribery against President Biden while he was vice president to be seen by members of the House Oversight Committee, other than the chairman of the committee, James Comer, the Republican from Kentucky who's actually overseeing the impeachment ordeal, and the ranking member of the committee, Democrat from Maryland, Jamie Raskin. Now, the Trump Justice Department actually investigated that allegation in 2020 because Rudy Giuliani, who was then President Trump's personal attorney, began circulating materials about Hunter, including what he said were documents about Hunter's damaged laptop. However, the New York Times quoted one person who was familiar with the material, saying some of it was junk that was plainly not credible, and DOJ could not substantiate the claims when they were investigated under former Attorney General William Barr, another Trump appointee. It's a fact. And as the New York Times said back in June, quote, The surfacing of the unsubstantiated allegation against Mr. Biden is the latest bid by Republicans to undermine the credibility of the FBI, which they have sought to vilify after the Bureau and the Justice Department began investigations into President Donald J. Trump's role in trying to overturn the 2020 election and his handling of classified documents after leaving the White House. Republicans have relied on former FBI agents, some of whom have embraced January 6 conspiracy theories and have even accepted money from a Trump ally to provide information against the Bureau, unquote. However, no evidence, but Republicans went ahead with opening an impeachment inquiry into President Biden on September 12th, okayed by, yes, the then Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, despite the fact that no evidence has been brought forth that the president received money as part of Hunter's business dealings or that he altered policy to benefit Hunter's clients. House Republicans even claimed that a man named Gal Loof, who was a dual U.S.-Israeli citizen, would be a truth-teller who would expose the Bidens. However, what was supposed to be, I guess, their star witness, unfortunately for Republicans, he was indicted by a grand jury last month for acting as an unregistered agent of the Chinese government and for helping Iran evade sanctions. You hate to see it. But Republicans went ahead with the first hearing of the inquiry on September 28th, which didn't go that well for them. Here's a clip from the hearing of one of the witnesses Republicans brought, Fox News contributor and George Washington University law professor Jonathan Turley, saying right at the beginning of the hearing that there was no evidence for this inquiry. In fact, I do not believe that the current evidence would support articles of impeachment. Can you explain uh, to the committee and the country why you believe that the current evidence does not support the articles of impeachment today? Well, at the moment, these are allegations, and there, are, there is some credible evidence there that is the basis of the allegation. But it wasn't just Republicans in the room. The Democrats were also there. And the Democratic members of the committee decided that they were going to draw attention to other issues. You remember that hearing came just two days before the government was going to shut down. That ultimately got averted at the last minute. Many Democratic members of the committee actually showed a countdown clock till the shutdown on computer screens next to them when it was their turn talking and they were on camera. Democrats also brought up how they believed that the impeachment inquiry was being conducted to try and turn focus away from former President Trump's four criminal indictments, which we've talked about on this podcast before, including Democratic Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett from Texas, whose time during the hearing went viral on social media. Here's the clip. She begins asking a question to one of the witnesses, who then answers, and then later she's holding up pictures of the classified documents found in Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence, which you could probably hear the papers rustling in the air. If you haven't seen the video, you should go see the video, but I'm going to play the audio here on the podcast. Take a listen. Have you ever heard them say, if, since we've been sitting here for I don't know how long? Yes, I, I, um, 
I've been taking a tally. Oh, okay. Can you show us? Can um, you tell so us what the tally is? More than 35 times, the Republican witnesses and Republican members of the committee have used the word "if." Thank you so much um, for that. Because honestly, if they would continue to say "if" or "Hunter," and we were playing a drinking game, I would be drunk by now. Because I promise you, they have not talked about the subject of this, which would be the president. But let me tell you something that was so disturbing as I walked in to this chamber today. As I prepared, I said, "What is the crime?" Because when you're talking about impeachment, you're talking about high crimes or misdemeanors, and I, I can't seem to find the crime. And honestly, no one has testified of what crime they believe the president of the United States has committed. But when we start talking about things that look like evidence, they want to act like they're blind. They don't know what this is. These are our national secrets. Looks like in the shitter to me. This looks like more evidence of our national secrets. Say on a stage at Mar-a-Lago, when we're talking about somebody that's committed high crimes, it's at least indictments. Let's say 32 counts related to unauthorized retention of national security secrets, seven counts related to obstructing the investigation, three false statements, one count of conspiracy to defraud the United States, falsifying business records, conspiracy to defraud the United States, two counts related to efforts to obstruct the vote certification proceedings, one count of conspiracy to violate civil rights, 23 counts related to forgery or false document statements, eight counts related to soliciting and I could go on because he's got 91 counts pending right now but I will tell you what the president has been guilty of he has unfortunately been guilty of loving his child unconditionally and that is the only evidence that they have brought forward and honestly I hope and pray that my parents love me half as much as he loves his child until they find some evidence we need to get back to the people's work which means keeping this government open so that people don't go hungry in the streets of the United States and I will yield. The fact is, y'all, there is no evidence that has been brought up against the President of the United States that would warrant an impeachment inquiry. Now, Republicans say that they are doing the impeachment inquiry to get evidence. Of course, we'll, we'll see about that. But, you know, Donald Trump's first impeachment, remember he was impeached twice, the first impeachment in 2019 was related to Republicans trying to find evidence on the Bidens because Trump had withheld military aid to Ukraine in an invitation to the White House for Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky because Trump wanted an investigation into Joe Biden by Ukraine, an Ukrainian investigation into Joe Biden, who was then, and is now, I guess, Trump's political opponent. So you kind of have to ask, like, is this impeachment inquiry in retaliation for that impeachment of their beloved Donnie Boy, because that impeachment had evidence. Trump even said that he withheld aid. That's against the law. But this one, so far, does not. Now, the impeachment inquiry is going to continue to roll on, just, you know, not right now, because there's no Speaker of the House, and the House can't do anything until a Speaker is approved by the majority of the chamber. And y'all, just sidetrack for a moment. It does, I mean, the Republicans look disorganized because you've got two candidates running right now. Jim Jordan, who is kind of just, he, he puts off a nervous, chaotic energy. And he's also been accused of looking the other way when informed of sexual abuse cases when he was a wrestling coach at Ohio State. And then you've also got Steve Scalise, who is running, who has referred to himself as David Duke without the baggage. David Duke, you know, is the former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Seriously? And then apparently Kevin McCarthy has said, well, if they want to nominate me again, then go ahead. And then, you know, so now you've got multiple people vying for the job, and apparently some Republicans aren't going to vote for one of the candidates. They only want one of them. They don't want the other. So then they're going to, you know, it's... It's a mess. And then George Santos, one of the Republican members of the House, was then charged earlier on Tuesday with conspiracy and wire fraud. So he is under his own criminal issues as well. So that's, you know, all that. So until they figure out a speaker, what's it going to be? Or, you know, I think it actually might be a real possibility 
that there are just some moderate Republicans who enter this power sharing agreement with Democrats and say, we'll take a moderate Democrat or a very moderate Republican, the one or two of those that are left in the House, or even Hakeem Jeffries as Speaker in exchange for this power sharing agreement, if it gets to be too much and they actually can't do anything. Because remember, the 45 day continuing resolution that passed the House to fund the government, the House needs to have a Speaker. So that in November, when funding for the government runs out again, they can pass funding for the government so it doesn't get shut down. If it got shut down right now, whose fault would it be? It wouldn't be Joe Biden's. It wouldn't be Senate Democrats. It wouldn't be Senate Republicans. It wouldn't be House Democrats. It would be the majority party in the House, Republicans, who currently do not have a speaker because eight members of their party voted to get rid of the speaker because he did the horrible thing of working with Democrats to avert a government shutdown. And then some Republicans got angry at the Democrats because the Democrats also voted to remove him. Like, why would they support Kevin McCarthy instead of their own guy? After, especially Kevin McCarthy after, the day after they funded the government. Kevin McCarthy went on Face the Nation on CBS and trashed Democrats. Democrats, some moderate Democrats have actually said they were thinking about voting for McCarthy, but then that, you know, he said those things. And so, you know, you realize Kevin McCarthy, oh, maybe he wasn't a skilled politician. You know, I'll just remember, remind you all, I think I said this last week, or I said this on Xander's Weekend Facts, but I'll just remind you all, Nancy Pelosi, last term as speaker had the same exact majority five seats it's the truth in the house and this was not a problem and republicans were not even losing votes brought to the floor democrats didn't lose a vote that was brought to the floor last year because you know lover or hater nancy pelosi knows how to do her job kevin mccarthy might not of course you know there are some Republicans in the House who would rather see it all burn, I think, than rather fund the government. And you can't really say that about, you know, the left-wing Democrats, the squad. You can't really say that about them because they voted to fund the government. So, you know, both sides aren't really the same. That's just what I wanted to outline there. As we go through this process of, for the first time in history, the House of Representatives ousting a Speaker of the House by a vote of the chamber. But wrapping this up here, the New York Times, you know, as the New York Times asks, should the vice president's son be selling the perception of access to his father, even if that son isn't delivering anything for that money? No, probably not. Hunter should not have been doing those things, you know, going to different corporations, different countries and saying, I can give you access to my father. Even though he didn't, there's no evidence that he did. Does that, you know, he shouldn't have done that. Does that mean it's illegal or impeachable for Joe Biden? No, probably does not. Now, if it turns out that there actually is incriminating evidence that President Biden asked for or received bribes from foreign governments or foreign agents, then yes, that would be a big problem. But doesn't it tell you something that Republicans launched an impeachment inquiry based on? No evidence, just vibes. McCarthy didn't even hold a floor vote to initiate the impeachment inquiry because he knew he didn't even have enough votes, even from Republicans, to pass it. Despite the fact that, you remember in 2019, then-Speaker Nancy Pelosi initiated an impeachment inquiry into Trump in 2019, but she didn't hold a floor vote until one month later. McCarthy claimed at the time that there must be an authorizing vote for it to be a legitimate impeachment inquiry. So according to McCarthy, this is not a legitimate impeachment inquiry. Of course, it's on hold for now because the House is without a speaker. Either ways, those are all the facts on the situation regarding Hunter Biden that you know, I think you need to know, in order to make an informed decision on this. Because just sweeping it under the rug, like a lot of Democrats I think want to do, isn't the best strategy and going full conspiratorial like some Republicans want to do is also not the best strategy. Getting the facts is the best strategy, as always, because P 
PBS NewsHour NPR Marist poll actually found last month that while 51% of Americans disapprove of the impeachment inquiry, 47% approve of it. The Biden crime family, y'all. But those are just all the facts that you need to know. And that's basically all the facts I have on this week's edition of the Xander's Facts Podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. If you liked all the facts that were on this week's edition of the podcast, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, rate and review the podcast, check us out on all the socials, and tell all your friends, spread the facts, Xander's Facts Podcast, tell all your friends about the podcast, the newsletter, and Xander's Facts on YouTube, because all our new episodes, including this one, get posted to our YouTube channel. Go check that out. And also check out the Xander's Facts link tree once again, because it does have all the Xander's Facts links that you need. That is episode 120, y'all. Thank you all so much for listening. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you got a lot of facts on this podcast, because the Hunter Biden name has been thrown out a lot recently in the political realm, and I don't think a lot of people really have a grasp on the entire situation. And so hopefully after listening to this podcast, you actually do, and you know the facts. And so that's what we had on episode 120, y'all. Next week, though, episode 121, we are switching things up, because it is October. If y'all didn't know, National Basketball Association, the season begins in two weeks or so. And so y'all know what that means. Our NBA season preview. And it is confirmed. Our Xander's Facts, our very own senior NBA analyst, Hillbilly, he will be back on this podcast next week to preview this NBA season. He is very excited, y'all. Hillbilly would be excited about any NBA season starting, but I think he's very excited about this one starting because of some off-season moves, which we'll talk about Next week on episode 121 of this podcast, make sure you tune in for that. But that is it. That is a wrap on episode 120 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see y'all with episode 121 next week. Electrocution.